Good morning. Good to see you. We uh, turn uh, for a while this morning uh, to Luke's Gospel. Um, I didn't give you the reading, did I? Sorry, Jess. Uh, anyway, we haven't got no notes, uh, no headings this morning, making you think a bit harder. Uh, I'm going to turn to Luke's Gospel in chapter 23. Um, I'm going to read a few verses from verse 39. Luke 23 and verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When I said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Well, we come today on what we recognise as uh, Good Friday. Uh, Historically, this country, uh, as its Christian influence has been over so many centuries, has a Good Friday. But what do we do as Christians? What's, what's, What's our thinking as we come to Good Friday? Well, I think the way to sum that out was with three simple words. First of all, we come uh, to remember a fact. We come to remember a fact that is as solid as any other fact that is known in this universe, whether it be scientific or natural. We come to remember the fact of history, the fact that unequivocally, There is a testimony from both the Bible and from secular history that a man called Jesus Christ was crucified on a day which we recognise as Good Friday. But we don't just come to remember a fact, we come to celebrate an act. Because that historic occurrence for the Christian has eternal implications. And as hard as a day like today, as we think about the events that took place may be, yet their fruit is in a joy unending for Christian people. So a fact, an act, but we come to to partake as Christians in a pact. A pact by faith we see in this work this great promise of God to commit himself to those who trust in him through his son Jesus Christ and that's why of course we call today Good Friday and what I'd like to do for a short while this morning is kind of trying to take something contemporary and try and evaluate it in the life or uh, sorry in the light should I say of what we read here Uh, in the Bible's occurrence. I want to quote you first this morning um, some words of of a uh, a, a man who spent a a great deal of his life, in fact the last part of it, seeking to undermine and pull down Christianity. Uh, A contemporary critic uh, of the Christian faith. He once wrote this, uh, let me read these words. Um, How moral is the following? I am told of a human sacrifice that took place 2,000 years ago without my wishing it and in circumstances so ghastly that if I had been present and in possession of any influence, 
I would have been duty bound to try and stop it. I wish I could say this, dear man, do you know what? That is so naive, but I'll come back to that. In consequence of this murder, my own manifold sins are forgiven me, and I hope to enjoy eternal life. Without him, that's Jesus, there could be no Good Friday as Christians naively call it. I'd like, by the grace of God, to try and unpack that whole idea and show why the poor guy got the wrong end of the stick and understanding what the Christian gospel and the message of Easter is all about. No Good Friday as Christians naively call it. Now, there, there are a whole number of biblical strands that we could pull together to kind of evaluate that. I want to do that this morning by looking at this well-known incident that occurred on the cross between Jesus Christ and this man who is called a thief. Because it seems to me there is nothing, humanly speaking, amidst the blood and the agony and the pain, the injustice, the hatred, the ignorance, that so explains as to why Christians with great joy and faith say this is a good Friday to remember what occurred. Nothing so displays the purpose of what Jesus Christ was doing on the cross and what happened between Jesus and this man whom, with whom there's a conversation. A conversation, of course, when you think about it, is absolutely, in, 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 the, whole, the whole idea is grotesque, the right word, that there as three men are being suffocated in the extremity of, of pain and anguish, there should be this conversation taking place, hung halfway between, as it were, earth and sky. There is nothing, though, that so encapsulates the magnificence of what it means when Christians say Jesus Christ is the saviour of all who will believe. There is nothing that so displays the beauty of Jesus' love for sinners as this little incident. And nothing shows you and I the authority that Jesus actually always possessed and displayed even here on the cross. Now, let me just start with a, a little illustration here. Um, for you of an older generation, you'll probably um, know the name Alfred Hitchcock, the great uh, film director. For a younger generation, you might want to tell some of the others, who is Stan Lee? No, 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 okay. well, Stan Lee is the creator of Marvel, Marvel Comics, yes? Um, and the great thing that Hitchcock and Stan Lee have in common is this, that they wanted a cameo in every one of the films that they made. So whenever you watch a Marvel film or you watch a Hitchcock film, you always got to look out for the cameo appearance of Hitchcock or, or, or Stan Lee. And of course, the thief, as we think about this, he very much has a cameo role. His whole purpose at this particular time, in terms of what's told, it, it, it's a vital role, it's a cameo, but his whole purpose is to say, look, what is it you can learn about this man, Jesus Christ? And it's interesting as we begin to think about him that he would have been very much in the spirit, along with his companion, he would have been very much in the spirit of the man who I quoted at the beginning. This whole idea of pouring scorn upon what Jesus was doing. What are you doing if you really are the Christ hung on the cross here? If you really are this one who's got all power, get yourself down. Get us down. Come on, what's the matter with you? You get the point, undermining what's going on. There's almost a, a, a naivety that somehow you should think that this man hung in the middle of us is someone special. That somehow this man should be someone who's chosen or got this, this gift of power and authority. It's naive. And that's how this man is first introduced to us. But of course, what we read of here is that he suddenly changes to embrace a naivety. 
he suddenly changes to embrace, and, and, it, and it's a precious gift of faith, he begins to embrace what actually Jesus Christ was doing on the cross. And you notice what we see is it's an embrace in that occurs because he begins, he begins to understand. If you are someone who's here this morning and you are not a Christian, um, there's probably lots of reasons for that. But at the heart of it is this, part of it is a failure to understand what God was doing, what Jesus was doing on the cross. And this man, as he hung, hangs there, suddenly begins to <coughs> understand what's going on. He would have been able, oh, well, sorry, no, he would have been delighted, that's a better phrase, to be able to sing, as we so often do. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, but poor contempt on all my pride. So let's think about what changed in this man's thinking and understanding. Five things, okay? Five things in which he began to see why we call this Good Friday. He began to see the good, and what a word to use in. He began to see the good that was in the horror of the cross. What were they? Here's the first. First is there was this realisation of the good God's involvement of what was going on. How is he introduced us? He's introduced by, first of all, hurling insults at Jesus, and suddenly he gets this change, and his, his companion carries on. And he insists to him, doesn't he, in, in verse 40, don't you fear God? Don't you figure, there's something about um, extremity that focuses the mind, isn't there? And suddenly he, there's something, he says to his companion, don't you fear God? Oh, what's he saying when he, when he says that? Well, what he's doing surely is this, he is beginning to see that somehow amidst all that's happening to Jesus on the cross, God is involved. That somehow God has not been dethroned because of the cross. Oh, lots of people think that, sadly. That somehow Jesus wasn't deluded as he hung upon the cross. That somehow the cross denies the reality of human existence and how it's lived. But he began to see that somehow the good God was involved. It's why, for instance, one of the great um, foundation statements of the Christian faith, what we call the Apostles' Creed, as it talks about God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, it says this about our Lord Jesus Christ, quite, sorry, Christ, quite simply, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. At that point, it's, it's making clear that somehow in this horrendous act, God was not absent, that God was actually involved. And the thief, as he began to, as he hung by Jesus, began to see what was going on and hear what was going on, began to understand. And I'm not suggesting to you for one second that he fully grasped it as we do, but clearly there was this realization that God was involved in what was going on. And of course, that picks up a great theme of how the Christian faith teaches the cross. The Apostle Paul so succinctly gives the Christian view of the cross in 2 Corinthians 5 when he says this, what, what was the cross all about? That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. <coughs> Sorry. Something about the horror of the cross has to be said was good because the good God was involved in doing something that nobody else could do. That's why when the Old Testament prophetically speaks of our Lord Jesus as a suffering servant, there, there is a little, little 
time and time again. It was the Lord's will to bruise him, to smite him. The Lord laid on him. And Isaiah can't get away from the fact, and what kind of, if you read that passage in chapter 53, what, what kind of blows his mind is that somehow God's involved in this. And this is the good God of creation, the good God who in everything that's good, and yet here he's involved. But there's a second thing. The thief began to evaluate the good in the man who hung on the cross. Do you know, one of the, the, the kind of, the, the incredible aspects of Jesus Christ being crucified was this, that what come together, two things come together which were incredible. The absolute injustice of what actually occurred that this was more than just, this was a railroad, railroad job. This was, a, this was something which was put together. This was something that was forced through. There was no sense of, of, of moral or legal or human rights about this. Here was injustice. But combined with that was perfect innocence. It wasn't as though just someone was being railroaded and say, well, look, I know it wasn't right, but actually, you know what? This guy was a bit of a, bit of a, you know, bit of a character. No, no, no. In Jesus Christ, there was this perfect innocence. And that, that, that allows me as a, as a Christian, and you as a Christian, to say to anybody who's, who's thinking about these things, or even uh, as, as the friend I quoted, a, a mocker of Christianity, it allows us to say this, friend, would you please show me from every single account that we have, would you show me any hour in which you can say Jesus Christ ever offended man, woman or God? In other words, can you, not, can you show me any way in which Jesus Christ did not show such a perfect hu humility and humanity, a perfect innocence in all that he said and did? And yet here we see that this good man, this perfect man, this innocent man, comes together and with the injustice, as it were, actually comes together on the cross. And, and this faith begins to grasp that. It begins to see that, that Jesus here is somebody who's just suffering unjustly. And then there's a third thing as he begins to think about this and see it. And, and, and I'm not making a mountain out of a mole here, here because I, we've got his written testimony. I'm just looking at the words he says, yeah? He begins to see a thirdly that although this is a beginnings of a good day, he reassesses that in him as a person there's no good thing. Verse 41, he says, doesn't he? We are punished justly. Now, you know, come on, you know what we like. Let's, let's be honest. None of us likes to own up, do we? We have a classic story in our family of my, my brother-in-law now, who is six foot something and now got his own children. Um, but uh, apparently, as a toddler, as a two-year-old, uh, my mother-in-law came into the kitchen one day and he was absolutely covered in flour and sugar. He obviously got in the cupboard before, you know, those are cupboard locks and was absolutely covered. And as she, oh, the first thing he said, not me, Deborah. <laughs> not me, Deborah. There is something inbuilt to it in us as, as human beings which refuses to accept, doesn't it, that somehow there's not a reason for what we do. Or actually, it's not as bad as we think it is. But here is a man who, in the light of the cross begins to say, do you know what? We're here justly. There's a great 19th century Anglican minister called Charles Bridge, or Bridges. If you ever get anything of his, read it. He, he, he is superb. He once said this. He said, sin will live everywhere 
but under the cross of Jesus. Get that? Sin will live anywhere but under the cross of Jesus. And here's an example. Here is a man who, yeah, you can say, look, surely it's just his extremity. And the, yeah, okay, but actually, here is a man who's engaged in a conversation, who a conversation is with Jesus, but has been vastly affected by what he's seen in Jesus. And here he is saying to his compatriot, look, we are here. Here is a man who's saying, here at the cross, I can't honestly say I'm good. And my dear friend this morning, that is where every Christian comes to us at some point that that makes them a Christian. When they begin to see that actually, do you know, when they evaluate what Jesus was doing on the cross, who it was that was on the cross, and they begin to look at themselves, they see themselves in an entirely different light. Every act, every thought, every action for the Christian is one that's now assessed in the light of the cross. And that is not just to kind of, (laughs) that is not just to kind of religiously pound us into the dust. No, 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 no. Thank God it's not. It shows me for what I am in the light of who Jesus is. Oh, but it shows me what a saviour he is. I love you still. You are mine. I don't care what it is you've done. I don't care how bad you... He was a man, I, I, I dare say, and, and I know I'm slight speculating here, but the fact that he was being capitally punished, he was a man whom probably none of us will reach the bottom of in terms of what he did. And here is a man who Jesus willingly embraces in conversation and, as we'll see in a few moments, brings him, promises to bring him into heaven. There is no one who is too bad to become a Christian. One of the great our tragedies that this whole contemporary, I keep coming back to this, don't I? This whole contemporary debate, uh, debate in society about change and certain people can't change. It, it, one of the great tragedies is that actually Christianity offers the greatest hope to all human beings because of what Jesus has done. But notice, fourthly, here this dear man reappraises the perfect goodness of the one on the cross. It's not just that the good God is involved on the cross, it's just not that in the light of the cross he sees no goodness in himself, he begins to see the goodness in the one who is there. There is probably no greater act of, of kind of a... If it wasn't true, you'd think that he was, excuse the phrase, you'd think he was taking the mick. But here it comes in verse 42, we're told, then he said to Jesus, uh, then he said, Jesus, Lord, remember me. Jesus, Lord, remember me. This is a man who was enveloped in darkness. Can you imagine? not just the anguish, suddenly the, 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 the darkness descends and, and, and he's enveloped in it. This is a man who could hear Jesus cry out at the beginning when he was now, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. This is the man who could hear the insults and, 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 the, uh, and the things that were said about Jesus, the mockery. Uh, and as he hung there, he began to say, he began to understand that here was somebody who was not just a man, but he was somebody who had a kingdom. Lord, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. As I said, it'd almost be um, grotesque, wouldn't it? Amidst the thorns and the blood and the hanging and the suffocation. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Why would he say that? Was it not because, as he, there as he witnessed, there was something 
in this one, this man Jesus, that attracted him, that drew him. <laughs> How many of you have ever taken your children, and I've got to put my hand up here, when they were younger, or you may have done it yourself, you know, gone, and sit, gone to see and to sit on the lap of that big man in the big red, red coat with the big white beard and tell him what you want for Christmas. And how many of you got there and your little one, or perhaps even yourself, um, a picture of me of a kid, I think, somewhere at home, with a three, four year old, crying my eyes out. He's a good man, and yet you cry your eyes out. That doesn't happen with our dear Lord Jesus. My friend, this man is saying to you this morning, and to me. Here is someone who is so good, so gentle with all the authority and the power that is his. That you may call upon him and he will say, I'm here. I'm listening. I care so much for you that I put myself into this world. You know, there's a mistake that Christians often make about the cross, that they think it's where Jesus suffered. He did. But the, the entire life of our Lord Jesus Christ, from the moment of his conception and he was born until he uh, died and rose again, was a life of suffering. He was a man who lived in abject poverty. He was a man who came from the back streets of a nowhere beyond. He was a man who spent his life growing up, for most part of it, probably with just a widowed mother to look after. He was a man who went about and could say to others, you know, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but I've got nowhere to hang my leg, uh, 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 <laughs> lay my head, thank you. And he was a man who now on the cross is suffering in anguish not for sins that are his own but for people like you and for me and that brings us to a, just a final thing notice that this thief finally choose, chose shall I say to rest his entirety in the good care of Jesus. Two words, two words. Remember me. You see what he's doing at that moment. At that moment in time, he's, he's looking away from himself and he's looking to Jesus. He's putting the onus upon Jesus. Lord Jesus, remember me. He's putting Jesus on the line. Will you really remember me? Are you really Lord? Will you really die and rise again? Will you really have a kingdom? Lord, if so, remember me. That's faith. That's trust. That's what Christian faith is. Lord, it's in this absolute belief that Lord Jesus Christ, you and you alone can save me. That's why Christians call this day Good Friday. That's why Christians naively call today Good Friday because they believe what God was doing through his son on the cr cross that there was this incredible, incredible problem being solved. A problem that, a, 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 that, that humanity is best has sought to struggle and answer. How can it be possible that a God who is good and kind and merciful, how can it be possible that this God is also a God of wrath? And how can those two things come together? How can a good God come together with the reality that he is a God who must punish sin? Can you find an answer for that? Because we've not been able to. It took the magnificent eternal wisdom of the divine triune God, Father, Son and Spirit to come up with this wonderful answer. There is but a way. It is for my Son, my only begotten eternal Son, to take upon himself human nature and to come and upon a cross to bear the propitiation of 
your sins, to pay for the wrath that is due for you and for me, to bear the, uh, away the expiation of all my sins through his precious blood. And here it is. That's why it's a good Friday for Christians. All my sin on him was laid. And again, you know, it's, it's the prophetic, the, the, the prophets who kind of pick this up and, and they're, just a, they're just aghast at it. Lord, we esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted. But, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, he to, to put him to grief. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. There was something dreadful going on here, but we, we, we naively believe because of what God says. There was something wonderful going on too. That God's son was bearing away the sin that separates me from my God. It's why, you know, the New Testament writers, the apostles, so often pick this up and are so kind of pointed about it. This is Peter. Jesus, he said, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Christ suffered once for our sins, just for the unjust, by whose stripes we are healed. Why do Christians naively believe it's a good Friday today? Not just because of what happened upon the cross, the wonder of it, but the power that flows from the cross. What power flows from the cross? Well, it's the power of God through the outpoured Holy Spirit who comes into the hearts and lives of men and women and says, you know what, there is something dramatically wrong with the, who you are and how you live. But there is something wonderful you need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as this message, this message of Jesus Christ and him crucified is shared, you can believe and you can come and trust and you can come and know that actually full atonement has been made so that you can freely approach God as your father Jesus as your saviour sorry through Jesus your saviour by the power of the Holy Spirit and let me close with this Jesus uh, sorry Christians call Good Friday Naively call Good Friday, Good Friday? Say that again, no. <laughs> Christians naively call today Good Friday, why? Because actually, like the thief, they've experienced that wonderful gift of God's love. Lord Jesus, please remember me. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Gee, the, the thief found the immediacy of Jesus' love towards him. Today. The thief found that Jesus' loved, embraced him with me. Today. The thief found the full assurance of Jesus' love towards him. You'll be with me today where? In paradise. They say, don't they, that there is nothing more, um, there's nothing more that a human being can experience uh, than the love of another human being, whether it be a love of a parent to a child, or a love of a man to a woman, or a woman to a man, or, or the love of a, a sister to a brother, etc. But there is, there's the divine love of the God-man towards sinners like you and I. Thomas Kelly, the uh, hymn writer, he got it right, didn't he? Why do we call 
Good Friday, Good Friday as Christians. Why? Because we sing the praise of him who died, of him who died upon the cross. The sinner's hope let men deride. For this we count the world but loss. Why? Inscribed upon the cross we see, in shining letters, God is love. I'm surprised you don't know that. He bears our sins upon the tree. He brings us mercy from above. Friend, I don't know where you're going to go home to today. I don't know what you're going to do, but all I want you to do is take away. This God loves you. And this God loves you so much that he's given his son for you. And this son, his saviour, Jesus Christ, loves you and will embrace you like he embraced his thief. And he is saying to you, I want you to be mine. I want to take this day and make it a good day because I want to bear away all your sins and I want to give you this wonderful new life, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Will you come this morning and have it? Will you make it a good day? Forget the hot cross bun. Forget the chocky egg. It could happen later on, Paul means. But here it is. Because God loves. And there is no love like the love of God. No love like the love of Jesus. Let's pray as we close. Our God and our Father, we thank you that we delight as Christians to be naive about our Lord Jesus Christ and this day in which we remember. We delight to naively embrace him as our only hope, our certainty. We delight to naively embrace him and his love, the love of the Father, the love of the Spirit, given to us through the love of the Son. And our God, we pray that you will grant to us, even this day, to rejoice that as dark and as tragic as those events were, yet all the glory of the goodness of God, of the goodness of Jesus Christ, that shone forth from them. Lord, hear us, draw near to us, and have mercy upon us, we pray. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.